Um, my name is Teresa Lubbers, and I have the privilege of serving as Indiana's Commissioner for Higher Education and the privilege to welcome you here this morning. We're delighted that all of you are here with us. Uh, I've had the chance to welcome you at the opening Weldon conferences since I became Commissioner, and to your delight or chagrin or something in between, that's been six years. Uh, it's been great for me and great for us to be here today together to continue our discussion about important cutting edge issues that impact the state of Indiana and higher education in particular. We find that these conversations that we have at the Weldon Conference allow us to start to think in a new or a renewed way about the importance of the issues that are, we're going to be looking at in the course of the next year. This year in particular, we'll be using what we learned today to really inform the work that we do as we develop the next iteration of our strategic plan. So thank you for helping us do that. Um, I'm especially delighted this year because we have made an effort to reach out to the employers in our state to really talk about the importance of the issue that we're going to look at, which is connecting college with careers. So thank you. I know this isn't your day job. You're all worried about doing other things to keep your this is uh, vital, but we think one thing that you should do as you think about preparing the workforce for the future. If you were with us last year, you will recall that we had uh, Brandon Steed with us, who was is who was the Gallup uh, company, and he, we were really releasing the results of the Gallup Purdue Index. And one of the key points we learned from that discussion in that index is the importance that graduates place on having had internships are some sort of work-based experiences while they're in college. We actually even talk a lot in Indiana about those experiences while you're in high school as well. Um, but we also know that students, um, when they've had the opportunity to be exposed to the world of work, they're much more likely to make informed decisions about their careers. Uh, I hope you're familiar with the return on investment reports that we put together for the first time last year. And it really talks about the value of college in a very expanded way. Both the economic advantages of education beyond high school, but also how we look at uh, students and measure of graduates' ability to live meaningful lives and give back to their state and their communities. Um, it gives us a, a broader and more uh, specific idea about how we need to look at combining the world of work with the world of school, and really blurring those lines. And I talked about that some in this year's uh, higher education address. We know that for the sake of employers, when you have the opportunity to observe students uh, in the world of work, you're much more likely to be able to see if they'll be good hires for you. Uh, and if they, in fact, will be, able to, will be able to fill those positions with some sense of confidence that they're prepared to do the job. The benefit for individuals is clear. I mentioned they're much more likely to make better decisions about their careers, and uh, they're much more likely to take their future seriously at an early age, and then to have a greater sense of personal well-being throughout their lives with the career choices that they have made. To the state, it's clear that when we're able to actually develop the necessary talent that we need, uh, the, that we are then will have an economy that will, in fact, be able to meet the needs address this skills gap that we keep talking about in Indiana. And I think, equally importantly, as you look at the brain drain issue, we're much more likely to keep Hoosiers and students in Indiana when they've had the chance to be exposed to an internship or some sort of work-based experience. So with all that in mind and with the clear benefit that we know uh, comes from having alignment between students and education and workers and employers, we've decided to bring together today a group of people who will help us talk about this important alignment between education and, the, and business and the world of work to discuss and really share some ideas about career readiness. Uh, during the course of today, our, our goals will be uh, several. First of all, we'd like to talk with you about what we actually mean by career ready and make sure that our lexicon with each, that Actually, we're talking to each other and we have some understanding of what career ready means, what higher education means when they're producing people who are students and graduates, and what uh, the business and employers think about those graduates when they come to them. So we're going to learn from experts um, about what it takes to give students meaningful workplace experiences. Uh, we're going to share ideas 
about how we can make those opportunities more prevalent. Uh, we believe that work-based experiences should be the rule, not the exception for students. And I think we need to do that with great intentionality as we talk about how to design internships, apprenticeships, co-ops, work-based experiences. And then we hope that today will serve as a continuation of strengthening the relationships between the academic community and the business community so that we gain a, a better understanding of the roles that each play. Uh, we're going to also try to gather some information, feedback at the end of today's um, event to actually instruct and inform us as we go forward. Yeah, Gary Dick from Inside Indiana Business will join us after lunch for an interactive uh, opportunity with you to get you to weigh in on, on your thoughts on some very important questions about this topic. <clears throat> and finally, uh, today's Weldon Conference comes just before Commission's first ever Career Ready Indiana campaign. It runs uh, from April until the end of July. It's the third of three uh, annual campaigns. Uh, we actually have college week in the fall, cash for college from January until now. And then this year, we're doing our Career Ready Indiana campaign. Please to take an opportunity to go on CHE's website and look at all the information that we have provided. I'd like to give you a, a sneak peek at a short video which we created uh, to spread the word about Indiana's efforts on Career Ready. I have to thank Doug Lintner and the communications staff for CHE for putting together what I think is just a great little sneak preview of what we're going to do for the next couple months. Um, for today's uh, schedule of speakers, introductions will be brief and tailored to the topic that they will be discussing, but, but you will have an opportunity to look inside your conference packets to learn more about the extraordinary lives and conversations that each of our speakers um, have been making throughout their lives. But at this time, I'd like to introduce someone who is obviously uniquely qualified to talk about the value of career preparation. Uh, Indiana's Lieutenant Governor Sue Elsperman, together with Governor Mike Pence, has led the way in, in establishing this sense of urgency about work-based experiences, internships, calling for, as the video showed, 10,000 new internships, to make sure that Hoosiers are really prepared for the world of work and to help us build a strong economy. We are very grateful to have the Lieutenant Governor with us today, but I think even more fortunate to have her leading these efforts at a critical time in Indiana's history. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and what a great conference. And I couldn't be more excited that we have not only educators in the rooms and administrators, but the business community as well. We really are at a great time in Indiana, and I applaud that video. I almost don't need to say anything now because those were great points. Just applaud every one of them. I also want to applaud the great leadership of your, our Commissioner of Higher Education, Teresa the great team that we have here that has really looked at the needs for Indiana's workforce and what higher education needs. Could you join me in providing a big round of applause to <laughs> Commissioner Lovers and her team. 
And the topic today, the connecting colleges and careers, is such a perfect topic. Uh, your conversations here are going to be so important to the economic future of the state of Indiana. As you know, Governor Pence and I really did make uh, workforce development a priority uh, even before entering office. And it was never more affirmed than in my first year as I did the 92 county tour across all of Indiana, met with employers in every county, and even at a time when our unemployment was still sitting around 8%, you heard employers saying, we can't find the skilled workers that we need. And so that has continued to resonate. And as such, uh, we went to work, as did the General Assembly. And even as you began to pull together some of the key facts, if you will, about the situation, we understood that there were more than 30 programs and funding streams that affected workforce development administered by five different state agencies. So that's a spaghetti bowl of its very own. And then if you look at $650 million in public funding annually going into education, training, and career development, all of that, knowing we could probably be doing things better. So with that in mind, the General Assembly put together the Career Council, which many of you know has been working now for two years. We've developed a strategic plan. We've done that in collaboration with so many players, higher education at the table, K-12, employers, uh, labor, all at a table working together to try to figure out really the mission, which is to ensure that education and training provided by the system meets the existing and future needs of Indiana's job market. Now think how important that is to truly align those efforts. And then using those broad directives, we developed a very data-driven strategic plan. And as you saw up here, as it talked about two-thirds of jobs in the next decade requiring some post-secondary education, that became a critical fact as we worked forward. And just last month, I'm going to speak to some of the work I, I chair, the uh, Career Council Pathways Subcommittee, and we've been reviewing um, those high demand, high, page high uh, pay occupations, which we're now calling priority now occupations. Those are the jobs that are out there right now for both incumbent workers and students in school. Now think about that. We don't always think about what all these careers are, but right now, thousands of CDL, truck drivers, out there that are going to earn over $60,000 a year. That is a six-week course, you know, and what that can mean in moving careers forward. We also balanced with those jobs that are out there right now, both four-year, two-year, and certification jobs. What are those that are out in the future, those emerging needs? We heard a lot from employers. We really need to be looking at the emerging needs. And so the Brookings Institute report talked about advanced industries, where Indiana actually ranks fourth in the nation for the most advanced industries. And measure that by the R&D that connects to that industry. Now, what is that? why is that important? Because where there's R&D, you're going to need STEM jobs. And so we know STEM will, re will continue to be a very critical area of need for the state of Indiana. And so I'm just going to offer a few suggestions drawn on some of the experiences both in the Career Council, as well as my six years at the University of Southern Indiana, as well as my backdrop of being a co-op education student, engineering student uh, out of Purdue many years ago. So let's start with the notion of career counseling. Career counseling is absolutely critical. We saw from the work that the chamber did with their survey, how in our high school, uh, very difficult for counselors to have the time to do counseling. So we know there's much more that needs to be done, uh, what happens and what doesn't sometimes occur before students enter higher education institutions like those represented here. And I think those meaningful conversations of how do we get career counseling to happen both in the high schools and in our universities is going to be critical. But I'm going to offer a perspective as a mother as well as an employer as well as a lieutenant governor. And we talk a lot about when we meet kids, we say, What's your major? What are you going to major in? When the question really ought to be, what career are you going to pursue? And then we'll step back and say, what education do you need and where should you go? But oftentimes, we don't spend enough of our time with our young people talking about what is the career 
you're going to pursue. And then given whether or not they have a career in mind, we can talk about those priority now occupations or the advanced industries. But I think all of us know it's more than just getting them into higher education, it's making sure they're directed. Now I see a few parents around the room nodding their heads. We know what happens when kids go on to higher education and they're not well directed. It takes them a really long time to get out. So there's lots of reasons for us to do more in making sure that those career discussions happen earlier. And really, no better way than through those work and learn experiences you can get in high school as well as in the universities. Now, in addition to those, I'm very keen on the mentoring opportunities. And I think that happens because I did come out of Purdue during a time when very few women became engineers. But do had a very strong women in engineering program that provided the kind of mentoring that helped ensure we could be successful. And in fact, it became the requirement as I had to go through women in engineering day at Purdue, whether they liked it or not, under duress as my oldest daughter did. But it exposed them to the careers and opportunities that they could see themselves in those STEM-related careers. Uh, I was pretty successful. I have one finishing a PhD in biomedical engineering now and the other in neurobiology. So I say we have to give those opportunities to our young people. And I, why so much focus on women? Well, we know that only a quarter of the STEM jobs right now are being feel, filled by women. And women, we're not a minority. We're over 50% of the population. So we've got to get our young women and men interested in STEM. And that's the reason two weeks ago, I offered to be the honorary chair of the Million Women Mentors Program, which we've now brought to Indiana, the goal nationwide. A million mentors for young women and young men. Uh, mentors can be young men and or men and women, but it is to connect mentors in the workplace to those young people, making sure that we're getting the word out about the STEM opportunities. I'm honored to do that in collaboration with the Indiana Girls Collaborative Project and the iSTEM Network, great institutions uh, that are working all uh, we have a goal of 5,000 uh, mentors in Indiana. We believe that's very, very achievable. And I ask that our universities be very engaged. You can be both the mentors and the mentees with your faculty, your staff, and even your students. Saturday, I was at Trine University in Angola and met a junior in uh, electrical engineering. She happens to also be their Society of Women Engineers president and said, how about helping me? How about taking some of your, the women at trying to go out into the high schools and help encourage those young women? So we can all be a part of it. It's not, we certainly do want all of the industry, but we also want the universities to be engaged. And you saw the 10,000 more internships. Absolutely is that doable. We should have a goal in Indiana that every student have an internship in high school and college that they, those are normal experiences. Having had the co-op experience, where I co oped five terms with General Motors, five different jobs, I knew very clearly by the time I completed what areas of industrial engineering I liked, what I didn't, knew a whole lot about the rest of engineering and production and what it takes, uh, and it really helps direct. And in fact, today I say I probably would not have finished an engineering degree not started early as a freshman, getting those experiences. And so those, those, uh, all of those internships help us to develop stronger career pathways uh, and make sure that our students are directed well. And so I encourage the universities to continue to build out your programs, uh, but further than that, to continue to use ways that business can be connected with you. They're all represented here today, and I know many are already involved in advisory committees and a board of visitors and many ways to better connect uh, in all cases. And so I hope that we'll continue to look for those opportunities uh, in the years to come, in the months to come. Uh, the Career Council's directives really are about aligning the education of our young people with the careers that are, are out there in Indiana. Indiana is making great strides, thanks to all of you in the room. Thank you particularly to the Higher Ed Commission and all those who work so hard. I hope that we can continue to enjoy
enjoy this continued conversation that we're having here today as we move forward in Indiana in connecting our workforce. Thank you so much for allowing me to join you today. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I think you've set the stage perfectly in today's discussion. Your comments about um, mentoring and counseling were especially insightful. And I, and I really appreciate the fact that you always talk about preparing for existing jobs, which I think you referred to as priority now, and then also thinking about the future, what we need to be thinking about in terms of emerging sectors in the economy and jobs as well. So thank you. It was a great way to start the day. Um, we now have another uniquely qualified woman to speak as our keynote uh, pre presenter for today, Carol D'Amico. Um, Carol is really legend in Indiana and throughout the nation for her work in education, higher education, K-12, and workforce development as well. Um, we had the pleasure of uh, having Carol serve as a member of the commission for many years, and um, I, I want you to know, if you don't know Carol, how very valuable her experience was for the commission. Um, she left, um, went to USA funds and is serving in that role now and bringing this discussion to a higher level on a daily basis, bringing with her great people surrounding the team that actually will be leading this work throughout the nation and uh, we're very grateful to have USA funds in Indiana. Uh, her professional experiences and her background, as well as what I've always about Carol, which is her very clear vision about what it takes to prepare a workforce. Make it a real honor to have her with us and to welcome her to the conference. Few people really combine the uh, education experience at the state and the federal levels that Carol brings to her job at USA Funds, uh, where she really is leading a great organization. Uh, if you don't know, they've had a strategic plan, and I'm sure Carol's going to talk about this. Uh, but they're, they're very strategically designed to talk about completion with a purpose. And I think that is very insightful for our conversation today as well. So please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Carol D'Amico. Getting up those stairs. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Teresa Lovers, uh, governors. Um, enjoyed your comments. Uh, it is really uh, quite an honor to be uh, your keynote speaker today for, for many reasons. Um, one, as Teresa mentioned, I was on the Commission for Higher Education for several years. And while I was on the commission, Teresa and her staff would also often tell us uh, that Indiana was uh, a leader in higher education policy across the country. And as a good commissioner, I would dutifully nod and kind of say, of, of course, and um, being polite. Um, but I can tell you uh, now that I have a more national view of higher education that's going on in many states. Uh, it is actually true. Indiana is in many ways a leader in this conversation across the country about how to raise the higher education attainment in this country. I think one reason it is a leader is because of events like this that bring together folks from a variety of backgrounds and maybe even a variety of viewpoints, but bring together in a very constructive way. And I think that because of Teresa's leadership um, and the commission that we in Indiana do have a tendency to um, resolve our differences in a very constructive way and to have very polite conversations about very tough issues. And I see that in some states, that doesn't always happen. So I want to applaud the commission for holding conferences like this. And yes, we will have our, our differences in Indiana about what to do about education and higher education but we do so in a very constructive way. And I hope that some of my remarks today will be um, challenging, but yet um, constructive. And as I prepared um, for this um, presentation today, I, I couldn't help but reflect on um, Kent Weldon, who um, the, con the conference is named for, and I know some of you probably did not have a chance uh, to work with Kent, 
But I do want to um, acknowledge that the commission has kept the tradition of, of the Weldon Conference because Kent was a, um, he was a very uh, smart, very knowledgeable person about higher ed, uh, but he had quite a sense of humor about him. And when I first met him, I was probably in my oh, early 30s, maybe even late 20s. And of course, I knew everything there was to know. I worked for state government, and I was you know, the, smart, the smartest person in the room. And, um, Kent would, um, in his own very professional way, uh, tutor me about a lot of these issues about higher education. And he did so um, as a, in, a, in a way that was uh, very helpful, constructive. He was a teacher. But he also uh, kept his own viewpoint in a very positive way. And, and I remember one commissioner, a former commissioner, um, it wasn't Stan, um, maybe some of you remember, who had a very prickly personality. I mean, he really rubbed Hoosiers the wrong way. Uh, I liked the guy. I thought he was very straightforward. And, um, you know, he's sarcastic. And you know, I, I enjoyed him, but he did not uh, always go over well. But one thing I noticed when he was around Kent, um, he was a different personality. Kent kind of softened his edges. And I think that a conference like this can do that. It can soften some of the very tough issues we're dealing with in higher education. So it is an honor to be um, the Weldon Conference um, for all of those reasons, and I hope that we have a very uh, thoughtful word or two about uh, USA funds for those of you who, who don't know us. Uh, we've been around since um, 1980, uh, headquartered here in Indianapolis. And we were started by a group of business leaders, I think, who were very visionary. Um, this preceded the Higher Education Act and federal involvement in higher education. And the group of business leaders thought that deserving low-income students needed financial assistance to be able to go to college. And so they started a loan guarantee program, and their vision to have one of these loan guarantee programs in every state where low-income students could get financial assistance in college. They got um, a little far along on their vision of having an organization in every state. And then along came 1965 and the Higher Education Act. And down as the federal government's involvement uh, accelerated. And they had these loan guarantee organizations in about 10 states. Uh, our mission, though, has stayed constant through all of, all of those years. Um, our mission today uh, remains helping students get access to higher education. But with the um, introduction of our new CEO almost two years ago now, uh, we have a new focus for that mission. And we call it um, completion with a purpose. And it is just what we're talking about today conference, and education to fulfilling careers. Because it is our belief that a fulfilling career is the foundation for a fulfilling life. And it is what generates civic responsibility. It is what generates volunteerism in our society. It is what helps to raise good families. That a fulfilling career is that foundation. And so the connection between education and a fulfilling career is, is a focus that um, is going to be driving our philanthropic and business solutions going forward. It is astounding to us that if you think about it, um, in 20 years, there have been 30 million Americans who have started college but did not earn a degree. And we would submit that this challenge is an economic and moral imperative that we must now turn our greatest attention to. And so most of my talk today is what can we do, and you'll hear a little bit about USA doing, around this issue of completion 
with a purpose and helping people feel a purposeful life. Now, I know that some um, may take issue with this, but I think the evidence is, is overwhelmingly undeniable that our students go to college to achieve what they think is that wage premium. And um, the wage premium for a college education is actually real. You do achieve a wage premium when you finish college. And it's substantial. It's over a million dollars uh, over a lifetime. But that wage premium is not achieved by everyone who fin finishes finishing not necessarily a guarantee of that wage premium. It depends. It depends on the major. It depends on your program of study that you complete with. And of course, you have to complete to achieve that wage premium. There is data that shows that having some knowledge and no degree will make you less financially stable than if you never went to college at all. So we are concerned about that connection between completion but if you are there to achieve that wage premium, you have to pay attention to what you do while you're in college. So that is why we have talked about solving at USA Funds what we call the 40-50 problem. The 40% of students who start college but do not finish, and the 50% of students who actually do finish yet find themselves unemployed, underemployed, wish they could change their major if they had to do it all over again. Nothing is sadder than somebody who's done all the right things, has finished college, and yet still finds himself, herself, unable to launch their career. So we pay attention to both, the 40-50 problem. But the sad truth is that that 40% of non-completers masks huge discrepancies if you look at it by demographic group. Four out of five dependent undergraduates from lower income families fail to complete their bachelor's degree by the age of 24. Four out of five low-income students do not finish. Six out of 10 community college students, large portion of them low-income, never earn a credential or degree. And in fact, overall, 8% of low-income students of color who start college do not finish in the United States today. That is the economic and moral imperative that we have in this country today. Because this is the bulk of the American population that is going to help fuel the economic vitality of this country. We've got to fix this problem. And the fact of the matter is there is a pipeline throughout the whole education process. Out of the 100 who start, 10 will ultimately finish. So when we talk at USA Funds about the 40-50 problem and how we're addressing it, we look at it at each stage of the pipeline because there are breaks at each part. And we'll talk today about some of the projects that we're doing at each stage of that pipeline. When we talk about our target population, because we are a, a modest foundation, um, a modest uh, a means, um, we're, not, we're not the Gates Foundation, for sure. We're not going to be able to fix this problem all by ourselves. So we look for partners. But we talk about where we can really focus our energy. And we've talked about three population groups, primarily, that we concern ourselves with. 
because those are the ones that are falling through the cracks at this leaky pipeline. Those students at risk that never finish high school, this whole population of what's now being called the disconnected youth, these 16 to 24 year olds who are not connected to school, they're not connected to family, they're not connected to jobs, and it's a huge of disconnected youth that we have to re-engage in some way. And then this big bucket of students who are the non-completers. In the United States today, 36.2 million Americans between the ages of 25 and 64 have some college but no degree. And the statistics have been put in front of you about how the majority of jobs are going to require some kind of post-secondary education. These are folks who cannot participate today in our economy because they are not qualified. And there are 750 some thousand Hoosiers in that category. We've got our work cut out for us, uh, both on the national level and at the state level. And then when we talk about the 50%, those who actually do complete, a half of them, almost half of them, are unemployed, underemployed, meaning they are in jobs that do not require a college degree. This at a time when there are over 1.5 million jobs a day that require a college graduate that are unfilled. So on one hand, you have this population that did all the right things, finished college, and got a million and a half jobs that need college-educated folks, and there's, they're not making the connection. Clearly, there is a disconnect between those graduates and what the economy is looking for. And look at the research on this disconnect. I think it is, um, it's real. It's not just uh, a theory. Uh, in a recent poll that uh, I did, I think for, for Lumina, Lumina's here and they can correct me, but um, it, it, it told the story to me. That you surveyed business leaders and said, how qualified do you think recent college graduates are for the jobs that you have available? 11% of business leaders said well qualified. If you ask the general public the question, how well do you think colleges today are preparing people for the workforce? 14% said well qualified. And I know I'm on shaky ground here, but here's what the result said. If you ask academic provosts, how well qualified do you think your recent college graduates are for the workforce? 96% said well qualified. Therein lies the disconnect. Employers and educators are not talking to each other in a meaningful to close this disconnect. And I would submit that the responsibility is on both sides. And I'll talk about one of the projects we have to bring both groups together in a more meaningful way. There are other surveys that ask employers, how well do you think transcripts tell you how qualified a person is for a job? And overwhelmingly, business leaders say, it is not helpful. If you ask them, what about the GPA? Well, employers say, that doesn't tell me much of anything about how well qualified. In fact, Google, uh, the head of Google made a statement recently that said, GPAs tell them nothing about the qualifications of the applicants. So the disconnect is real. So what is important to employers? Well, they have made a mystery of it, we know. We know from surveys what matters. Depth of knowledge matters. A 
distribution of knowledge, which is why Teresa is talking about internships, um, applied job experience, the ability to take what you're learning and apply it to a real life situation. If you ask about how important is the major, the governor talked about the ma how important are majors. 70% of employers said very important or important, compared to 98 who said depth of knowledge. And where you go to college, only 54 of employers said or very important. It is what you know that matters and what can you do with what you know. So what do we do with all of this information? Well, we know a lot about how employers want their employees to apply their knowledge. They, they have told us that. And when I looked at how they express it, they don't always do a very good job in expressing it in job ads. But when you sit down and you ask employers, what is it that's important to you? They say things like creativity, imagination, the ability to, to connect things and to create new ideas. Social intelligence, the ability to work in very nimble organizations and to work with a variety of people. Self-initiative and adaptability because work changes so quickly because of technology. Cross-cultural competencies. And we know that we live in a global society to be able to relate people across the globe. Analytical thinking, the ability to translate vast amounts of data. This is the era, era of big data. The ability to translate that data into something meaningful so that you could make decisions, so that leaders in an organization can make decisions. The ability to, to find patterns and trends. New media literacy, to be fluent in the new media literacy and to be transdisciplinary so that you see the bigger picture and not have a narrow view of, of the world. The ability to communicate, um, and I love this one, the ability to tell and sell a good story instead of relying on PowerPoints, just done. But I not an over-reliant. That was my goal, not an over-reliant. As one of the employers said, being able to explain a key idea in 140 characters or less is the new definition of cogent. Um, I obviously have not uh, stuck with that either. And I, I know that this sounds a lot like the liberal arts. So some of the liberal arts uh, folks in the room are going, this is what we do. And yeah, it is what you do. And so employers don't always communicate that very well, that that's what they're looking for. And educators don't always do a good job of documenting those skill sets in their graduates. And that is part of the disconnect. But at the rate of change we're going, and maybe um, this might be a surprise, and, and I hope not contrary to what Governor Spell Elspeth was saying, but to be able to train somebody for a specific job this day, maybe not um, the best approach when you think about how fast jobs are changing. But to be able to prepare for careers, to be able to prepare for that that groundwork. So when the job changes, when the job disappears, when new jobs come on board that did not exist five years ago, a person is educated enough to be able to adapt to fill those jobs. So I am not talking necessarily about job training when we say connection of education to work. It has to be broader than that. So what are we doing at um, USA Funds to, to address this and what we see nationally, and this is not unlike our colleagues at Lumina and Gates, and other major foundations seem to be all converging on the need to address 
this growing population that are not benefiting from uh, post-secondary education to participate in the American economy, and also this connection between education and work. It's a common theme you're going to hear across the philanthropic community, I believe, um, more and more. But there are three projects I want to talk about uh, that we're engaged in, and in um, parts about it. One is the project we have with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Because of this disconnect, and the fact that we thought both parties own the disconnect, both parties need to work together to fix the disconnect. We have a project with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that will support regional communities across the country in changing the conversation between educators and employers using supply chain management principles. Now, when I was um, head of the, the organization Connexus a few years ago, it is the state's advanced manufacturing and logistics um, initiative. I remember talking to the head um, of the organization that was going to hire me to be the head of Connexus, and he was talking about the logistics sector. And I was nodding my head, and I was thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder what that is. But I could do that. Um, well, I've become quite enamored with the logistics uh, sector and supply chain management. And so when you start thinking about how educators and employers treat each other, the use of supply chain principles makes a lot of sense. What are some of those principles? Well, when you're a company and you're looking for suppliers, for you, whether it's a manufacturer or healthcare provider, you need vendors to help you um, supply what you need. Um, one of the things when you ask companies, what do you look for in a supplier? They will say, I look for a supplier who will be as vested in my success as I am as vested in my success. We have a mutual interest in each other's success. I thought that was an interesting way to look at it. Another uh, element of a good supplier, you anticipate each other's needs. And you tailor your services to meet the customer. And you do it just in time so that I, as a company, and I have a good supplier, I'm not, I don't have over inventory, and I'm not waiting for inventory to come to me. Because they know my needs. We've talked about it. We share data. We understand each other's business models. We help each other solve problems. Common language, common metrics. So when you ask employers, do you have this kind of relationship with your local education providers? They say, no, of, of, of course not. They don't even think of ed their education providers as a supply chain partner. And when you ask educators, do you have this kind of relationship with your employers? The answer is usually no. Too difficult to talk to them. They don't really know what they want. They don't really articulate what they want. The CEO has a different view than the HR person. The HR person wants the easy way out. There's, they're talking past each other. And so the project with the US Chamber of Commerce is how do we get educators and employers using supply chain principles to start looking at the relationship different. And what we hope will come out of it is very different curriculum, very different processes employers actually access talent and how the educators actually deliver that. We're in the very beginning stages of this. We just, uh, the chamber just put out a request for proposals. They have received uh, several from around the country and are looking to fund up to five of them. And we will be, of course, reporting out what we're learning. We would like to have um, a project like this in Indiana. It wasn't one of the places that applied for the work, but we are working um, with a couple of industry organizations to see if it's possible to do uh, some of that work here. So that's one project that we think is, is worth watching. Um, the second bucket of work 
has to do with spurring innovation. Along these lines, other lines as well. Because we believed that the, if you believe in players, that transcripts and GPAs don't tell the story, we think a focus on competencies and how an educator in, uh, identifies and reports out those competencies is part of the solution. So how would educators reorganize how they think about their curriculum and their assessment around not what courses the student took, but what the student actually knows as a result of their experience at that institution. So we have a bucket of work designed to help higher education providers think about their curriculum in terms of competencies and report those competencies instead of the usual way of credit hours, GPAs, and, and transcripts. And we're doing this with um, institutions of higher education. Uh, in one of the states we're working in is Missouri, where the governor got very involved in this and challenged his public institutions to redesign their curriculum around competencies. We also have a project with Purdue University where the, Purdue is starting a brand new degree called the Polytechnic. And it's a blending of the technical and the liberal arts calibrated to the needs of um, employers. And they're actually going to start this Polytechnic in high school and the student will, it will culminate in a three-year bachelor degree of the College of Technology, the Purdue Polytechnic. We think this addresses many of our initiatives. It helps with the pipeline. It helps with the calibration to the employer. It's, it's going to be competency-based, and it's going to reflect the competencies that employers say they need. And we're, we're very excited about uh, is that again very beginning stages and the planning stages and they're they're getting very far along on that planning and it, I believe it will be a national model as well as one for the state of Indiana. Uh, we're also working with Ball State University on how to redesign their nursing program with community health and it is again this accelerated the students are spending more time at the hospital and it's not, um, the clinicals are not an afterthought, but the hospital experience is an integral part of the preparation of, of those nurses. We're also supporting, along with Lumina and many of our other colleagues, a program um, called the University Innovation Alliance. Purdue is part of this. 11 land-grant universities across the country are looking at ways to, in particular, address income students of color graduation rates in this country. And they have said, what we are doing, this population is not acceptable. In fact, the head of Georgia State University made a speech last week where um, I was attending a conference, and he said, the tyranny of low expectations in higher education must end and it's going to start with us and these 11 land-grant universities and Purdue is one of them have committed to raising the graduation rates of low income of color through innovative uh, models and through sharing their data with one another can you imagine they're going to look at each other's data I don't think we could get the universities in this I'm not going to go there. Um, I, think it would just, I think it would be difficult to achieve that kind of partnership uh, without the commitment of presidents saying this is too important for us not to work together on it. Another project we have on the innovation front is with our Commission for Higher Education. And they have made a commitment to 21st century scholars in this state. Because as they looked at the data, uh, they were disappointed by the graduation rates, college graduation rates, of 21st century scholar students. These are low-income students who the state of Indiana has made a commitment to them to go to college. And we were not giving them the support they needed to finish college. So uh, the Commission for Higher Education 
has uh, secured the services of a company called Inside Track, which is a, a mentoring program to help the 21st century scholar students. Ivy Tech is participating, Indiana State University is participating, and um, IUPUI, I believe, is participating. And they are already seeing in this one year, um, I think, very surprising and good, positive retention rates of 21st century scholar students from semester to semester. So those are the kinds of things we're doing in, in innovation. And finally, I want to talk about data, which I've, I've, I've made uh, mention of. Um, we applaud uh, Indiana and the Commission for Higher Education for putting out that return on investment report. It is a national model. For the Commission for Higher Education to report to the taxpayers, to students, consumers of higher education, what you can expect to earn one year, five years, and 10 years out by program, by institution in the state of Indiana. It's, that's groundbreaking. And other states are, are looking at that report, and we're holding it up as, a, as an example. Because it's the beginning of helping students make good decisions. Because you remember, part of the 50% problem is the 50% who they could change their major if they had to do it all over again. How sad is that, that they finished, they may have taken out 40,000, 50,000 in debt to finish that major, and it did not launch the career they had hoped. The earnings data will be part of helping people make good decisions. It's not everything, but it's a part to make a good decision. But we know that earnings data is not every, everything about the value of higher education. There's, in, there's intangible benefits to higher education. And we recognize those as well. Which is why we have been in conversations with the Gallup um, organization to do more in Indiana so that we could show the picture of this is how you will fare with earnings if you graduate from a program of study in Indiana, by program, by institutions, and here is how alumni have felt about their experiences after they have left the college. Here's how alumni have felt about how well prepared they were, looking back at it. How fulfilling a life do they have based on their college? And we think the, the marriage of that quantitative data of earnings and the qualitative data self-reported fulfillment make a very good marriage of starting to think about what a college value report might look like for the state of Indiana and for states as well. We will have a report coming out that we've commissioned the Gallup to do on um, the value of associate degrees. Um, they have done, uh, with Lumina's help, they did a value of the bachelor degrees and we've, we will have a comparable study on associate degrees nationwide that will come out this, this spring so that we will be able to compare the experience of those who have finished a, an associate degree with those who have finished a bachelor's degree and how that experience has laid a foundation for a fulfilling life. So look for more uh, about that in the next few weeks. So I hope that gives you a flavor of what we're up to. We have a lot of um, staff here today from our uh, philanthropic department. Um, I think they just kind of wanted to check on me, frankly, and see what I, what I would say. Um, but they'll be happy to tell you more. We've got a um, um, robust portfolio, a growing portfolio of, of work around this area of completion with a purpose. So thank you so much for having us here today. It has truly been an honor to be part of this conference. I applaud you for your conversation today. And Teresa, we look forward to some great things to come, uh, more great things to come out of the commission. So thank you very much. If there's time for questions. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, so we have, my, we have time just to take a few questions. Um, 
not surprising to me, frankly, to me, Carol has not disappointed us in terms of uh, providing um, a really balanced approach to the challenges we and the opportunities as well here in Indiana. So um, she's consented to take a few questions and we'll try to work the room if we have them. So if you don't ask them, I'll start with mm -hmm. one. Any questions? Uh, uh, you can be thinking about it for a moment. Um, would you spend a little more time talking about the 40, 60, Challenge is that is that the way you read? forty fifty forty fifty challenge and as I understand it this is these are national numbers so they would not necessarily in in Indiana would you have any idea whether our numbers would look like that or would they look different first of all and then um, any specific ideas that you could talk about again about what we could do in Indiana to address that um, Teresa I'm sure you and your staff probably know the completion rates better than I do in Indiana. I have no reason to think they're any better um, than those national numbers, uh, for sure, and it might be a good future project for, for us. Uh, in Indiana, I think we've got a lot of resources um, to address the 4050 problem. I think hoping today that you talk a lot more about how to incorporate work-based experience into the college experience, because I think it's a big part of that 50% uh, problem. I think that the work experience is very valuable to employers. That's an indication of how you have applied your, your knowledge. But I also think that it helps students figure out early on what they like and don't like to do. Uh, one of the projects where, a uh, set of projects we have starts in high school Exposing students to work, getting more students directly in a job. I think that's one thing we could also think about in Indiana as we think about this pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of organizations around this, especially the disconnected young adults. Some of these adults don't know anyone who works. They don't know anyone in their family who works. They don't know anyone in their neighborhood who works. The concept of work is theoretical. And we know it is work that really provides self-esteem. It's work that provides self-confidence. It's work, it's work that helps you figure out what you want to do. Uh, my first job was in an ice cream store at the age of 15. Two things came out of that. I don't eat ice cream today. And second, I realized uh, working with the general public is probably not going to be my thing. <laughs> um, so you know, it, this is what helps you figure out what you want to do. Um, another body of work that we're doing with Complete College America is helping uh, institutions assess students on the front end about their careers and to try to give them information about their passion, their interests, their aptitude, maybe earnings, put earnings on front of that, to do that up front, not at the end, see the career office at the end of your experience, see the career office on day one and start having a purpose because those undecided students are those that are at risk of never finishing and they're part of the 50 percent. So I think there's lots of things we can do in Indiana all through um, that, that pipeline. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, a question. Um, when you spoke about the leaky pipeline, you said the hundred students that entered um, high school, two th we lose two-thirds of them before they even make the decision to pursue a college degree. What happens to that two-thirds of the students? Have you done research to figure out where do they fall? What, what, uh, what happens to the two-thirds of the students who don't make it to pursue a college degree? Well, you know, you probably know as well as I do, um, they've, many of those students flounder around, you know, job to job. Uh, some of them stop participating in the labor force. And what happens is then there's no attachment back. There's no way to, there's no pathway to get back. There's, there's, there's no easy route. The community college system um, specializes in helping those students get re-engaged. But that takes a very motivated student to be able to walk back in. 
Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do, especially if you've already have children and, and you have life situations get in the way. And that's why this disengaged youth, these 16 to 24 year olds, is a focus of ours because those are the students who need to find their way back. And we need to make it a lot easier to find the way back and ease that transition back into, the, back into, and into that school. I was on a panel last week, Ivy Tech participated as well, and we talked about alternative ways to get students back into that community college. Um, some community colleges, and I'm not, I'm not talking about Ivy Tech because I, I don't know anymore, but some community colleges, the first thing that they do to those students who have come back is give them a math placement test. Well, here you have somebody who's been out of school for 10 years, and to give them a math test on, you know, as they walk back in is a very frightening thing for some of these folks. So how do we ease that transition? Um, and make it easier. Again, that leaky pipeline. We've, we've got to smooth the transition uh, for some of these young people. So that's a, an area we're focused on. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can crystallize my question. Uh, I, could, I could go in lots of different directions. First of all, Lieutenant Governor, your, your comment about careers versus um, you know what they're going to study I, th I think that's so on track um, because again our, our high school kids um, they're reaching they're, they're trying to figure out what it is that they want to be and myself by my own admission you know I chose a, a, a career path because it had dollars associated with it and I find it interesting the reports that we put out are teaching kids about what income that they can actually earn. Uh, I understand the rationale for that. I guess getting getting back to you know what what you're researching, what you're doing. What I'm curious about is you have a broad reach across the country. Does the state of Indiana have any difference that we can leverage uh, with our youth? And where I go with that that question is, I believe that many kids historically have been associated with the farming community and as a result they they learn how to work. and do we have a benefit there that still exists that we could leverage differently than than what we have historically i think governor elfman would answer this as well absolutely um, if there was one thing you do here across the country and i'm sure you hear it uh, as well is is the work ethic of the who the hoosier workforce both because of the manufacturing routes agriculture. Um, the challenge is you've got people motivated to work, it's, it's the skill set, the skill deficit that is, is not allowing them to participate in this new economy in Indiana. There is a skill deficit and um, that, that's the differential, that's the gap that I know the Career Council and the Work Councils across the state are trying to address, with, especially with that adult population. Uh, those folks that have been in the workforce for 30 years and their skill set is not quite to where it needs to be anymore. So is there something as employers? I mean, I think internships are important, certainly that's what we're talking about today. Is there even a something as employers The question was, what can employers do to help with this skill deficit? If you've got motivated employees, potentially, but they don't have the skill set, what can employers do? A lot. One thing that they can do, one of the projects we're interested in is, is College for America, where they come in to the employer and they'll say, we'll help your employees get to an associate degree. If you pay the tuition, and for them it's $2,500, you allow them to apply what they're learning to the job, maybe give them some time to do that on the job, and you invest in them. Not to, I don't know your company, but a lot of employers today, yeah, they provide tuition reimbursement, but A, it's reimbursement, so the employee has to come up front with the money. Two, they don't pay enough attention to what the employees are studying. It's not connected to their job. 
and it's that 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 reimbursement is looked at as an a, a, well it's one of the benefits we offer it's an investment in that person and so that's why we're hoping the town supply chain management project with the u.s chamber starts the conversation in re, in community you treat the conversation about your own employees that has to be part of as well do you have those relationships with your education providers that it could be seamless it could be integral only in, in really in America do we treat education and work as two different silos we need to marry those two all around that education pipeline including the incumbent worker who needs to keep upskilling in order to move up the wage ladder and the career ladder so I'm hoping today the breakout sessions are designed to stimulate that conversation and we would be very interested in supporting projects like that um, in Indiana. Over here. Oh, sorry. Hi, Carol. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I think we're all very interested in higher education moving away from these raw things like credit hours and GPA towards something more meaningful like competencies. But as I was listening to you, I was thinking it's like after I play nine holes of golf, which is a sport that I love, instead of having a score, which is ugly and awful, I would just kind of write an essay about my golf match. And I'm just wondering if you could describe for us how an institution of higher education would describe in a shorthand way what the student knows and how competent they are. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. And I, too, some wish I could write an essay on my uh, my scorecard on golf it's like I, I always come home and say you know I played better than the score would indicate um, I think that that's why we're funding a lot of these projects and Lumina has uh, done a lot of work on this issue of competency based um, and I know that Liz could probably talk a lot more about how you re-engineer the curriculum to focus on competencies and they have a uh, process uh, Lumina has supported on, on doing that and it it is not essays I mean it really is looking at those competencies that we know are foundational competencies for careers not jobs for careers and breaking those down you, we do that already in the syllabus right we say in a syllabus those of you from higher ed this is what you will know and be able to do from this course but that's not unknown um, in the courses we have. We don't always assess those that way. We don't report out that way um, to the employers. We, pro we provide a grade on the transcript. We know what we want the student to learn from that course. Every instructor does that. You have to file those. What we're saying is, do we re reorient the thinking and the course delivery so that students can work through those competencies that you've identified at their own pace because right now we hold the time is the, is, is the constant <laughs> and um, instead of that we would say time is the variable you could do it fast you could do it slow here's what you're expected to know and we're, when you know it we're going to it off and move, you'll move on with your life and then we'll report out on your transcript won't be a grade a B minus whatever that means it'll be you excelled in these competencies now that is not easy to take the courses we have um, and we're learning a lot about how to do that at institutions through some of our our grant work but um, it's not like it can't be done it's already we've already gone that path we know in a syllabus what the, what we want the student to learn we just don't assess and report on on those on that basis so there's a lot of work being done on this you can you know look up com competency based uh, education and find books written about it. It's just harder to do. Hi, Carol. Um, I just wanted to ask you. I'm over here. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was I was listening to your comments about um, marrying education and work experience and the importance of students having internships and that sort of thing before they graduate. And I was actually just reading some stats about networking the other day um, and how something like 80% of people report that 
um, the jobs that they found actually came through um, networking and not necessarily advertised positions. Um, and I was just wondering what um, you think the importance of higher um, institutions of higher education um, placing maybe students in a course that teaches like soft skills, um, how to talk to people, how to network. Um, because I think that, you know, myself, a lot of my opportunities have come from networking not advertised positions, in fact, most. So I was just wondering what you think the importance of not only the internships, but also teaching students those soft skills throughout college. You know, that's a, a, a question. In fact, um, I was talking to an intern uh, last week, and um, we had gone to some meetings, and I said, you know, you should contact that person. I think they would be good for you, um, and maybe they'll even offer you a job. And he said, I don't know how to do that. And, and I said, you know, that's how I found every job I've ever had is by talking to people and networking. But what you learn in the internship is how the world works. Right? I mean, you learn not just the hard skills, but you learn how the world of work works. And that's why I talked about that disconnected youth when they don't know anybody who works. What you learn in a job, oh, this is how it works. This is how, when you meet people, um, this is how you can help, how they can help me, and here's how I can present myself. That, you learn by doing that. You learn by working, and that's why the work experience, whether it's called internship or co-op or whatever you want to call it, it's knowing how the world works and how we all learn that. Um, and if you don't have parents who can coach you, and you don't know anybody in your life who works, the only way you're going to learn that is by doing it. And somebody's going to have to introduce you to it. Um, and, and that's why I think the work experience is so important with the, ed with the education. The 10,000 internships that the state of Indiana has set as a goal is, is so important for that reason, especially for that population that we're trying to address. They're not born knowing this stuff. Right. Hello. Um, I'm one of those people that fall into the 40, 50 range where I've achieved a degree. Um, and in relation to the students I work with, there are the students who, you know, they want to be that nurse, but they don't necessarily have those math skills or they don't have that, but they have the passion to do that. So when it comes to the point of the student, you know, maybe they fall out because they couldn't get into the nursing program or they couldn't get into the exercise science program. So then you have that student who's then just, you know, settling for a particular degree just to finish. And that's kind of what happened with me. Um, I was in nursing because I wasn't good in math, so I switched from pre-med. Eventually I did find my passion in public health, but now I'm in a point where employers expect you to have all these skills, but most students do graduate in five to six years and so you're doing what you can while you're in school to finish so when you finally try to get a job you can't get one and when students you know they ask me oh you know did you get a job out of college I'm having a harder time than ever just to get a position so I can't really tell students oh yeah you know I got this degree it was worth it and it's kind of discouraging sometimes when you're trying to do better but there are barriers you want to go to graduate school but a good test taker but you have to take the GRE but I feel like that doesn't really show knowledge for you to get back into school so I have those students who you know ask me questions like I really want to be a nurse or you know but I I'm not going to get into the program so what would I do now and that's when you run into the problem of not finishing in four years and getting pushed back further and further and so those students are rushing to get things done so they don't have the opportunity to necessarily complete an internship because they now are in a different major than where they began and they're now on that ticking time scale so for those particular students how can we most effectively help them when maybe they came in wanting to be a doctor but they necessarily didn't have the skill set but now they're in that fourth year of graduation lost and they don't know what they'll do after because now they're in this major just to graduate. And that necessarily doesn't improve the workforce here in Indiana when you can't get a job. Well, thank you for sharing your story and for, I think, being a good case study for the 40, 50, because 
the message we send to a lot of young people is finish college, finish college, finish college. And yes, um, that is important to finish what you start. But what you finish in is just as important. And that's why we believe that 50 part of the problem, you have to marry the completion with a purpose. The Complete College America grant that we have that tries to help students assess up front what are your passions, what are your interests, what are your aptitudes? And here are some choices. I don't think we should ever in America track students um, and we, the government decide or school decide. But people need better information to make good choices for themselves. And so we start to send messages, finishing is important, but you have to think about what you want to do and what you're suited for and what will provide you a good opportunity. And that would be on all of us to figure out ways to do that with limited resources we have. Um, that's why I like the Inside Track Project, because it says, as an institution, I can't do this advising all myself. I need help. Here's a company that helps do advising that for some, some students. We need to think of creative ways to try to help students figure this out. Um, because finishing in itself, as you point out, is just not sufficient. It's important. But finishing towards what? And we've got to keep, we've got to keep that in mind and send those signals to students and help them figure it out sooner. Uh, um, it is the economic imperative. Um, Hello. It looks like I'm getting the hook Oh, no, here. We'll, we'll take one more question, okay. and then there may be time. Did you have a video you wanted to show? Oh. I forgot the video. Okay. Uh, I, we'll take one more question, and then I don't know. How long is the video? If, would you like us to, we still have the video? When, when you sent up that note, forget the video, I thought you meant I was supposed to stand still because they were videotaped. <laughs> That's a disconnect, Carol. <laughs> That's, a disconnect. That's, you know, they, they keep forgetting that I'm an old broad. They have to, you know, really talk me through it. Um, I forgot the video. So. so we'll have time for the video if we can get that up and ready to go. We'll take one more question. Sure, thanks. Um, so I work in the nonprofit sector and uh, we provide opportunities for the youth to be successful. And what successful I mean, whatever that means for that particular student. Um, so the thing that I'm seeing from their perspective is, is shown in that graph that you, that you represented with, the, I think it was 14% that they say college investment is not even by choice. And I don't know what to tell them when they come and say, well, I'm, I don't want to invest $50,000, $60,000 in something that I'm not going to get a job out of, you know? Or it's kind of a iffy thing. Um, I have a, I've worked with a, I'll give you a few examples. Um, a graduate student in, on computer engineering, he said, I don't know if I want to finish my master's because I can, I can use that money, go to Florida, have a nice vacation, have two, three weeks of training, get a certificate, and get employed right away. Um, I work with another student who is uh, a sophomore at Purdue, and he already has two companies. He's employed eight people. Uh, I have another one who was admitted to IUPUI but the cost is so much for her that she chose to go to Ivy Tech and she's about to present her research from last year uh, doing brain aging work uh, uh, with uh, one of the professors at IU School of Medicine. So I, I, I try to put them in path for success, but often I see that in that path, college is not part of that equation. So how do we take the barrier maybe of financial uh, help or, or just lowering the cost to make it uh, appealing to them again. Well, you know, not everyone needs a master's degree. I, you know, I think we should accept that. Um, and not everyone needs a bachelor's degree to make a good living in Indiana or in the, in the United States. And that's why finding your passion and doing what excites you and you're good at, we should accept there are lots of ways to do that, and, and the traditional higher ed is one way, but it's certainly not the only way. And so in some cases, people might be making a very rational decision um, about not to spend um, 
money on a degree for which they may not ultimately want to benefit from. It's just not their thing. We shouldn't force everybody into that one model. I don't think that's what you were saying, but I just wanted to say that because I wanted to make sure people understood that when I say college, I don't mean that it's four years or masters. This should be for everybody. That it's not necessarily the case. But I, I do think that the data, we need to make consumer information a lot more available so people have choices to make. Life is a series of choices. But you need to have the data in front of you. And so you might be making a very rational decision not to spend $60,000 on a master's degree in a field where you may not ever get that return, which is maybe very rational. You may never get your return. If that's what you want, put it in the stock market. I mean, if you want other things in life. I mean, we've got to help people understand you know, what they will get likely what they won't get and make those decisions for themselves. Um, for some people, there, there may not be an economic return, but there may be other reasons to do it. So I think good information, what they don't have now is good consumer information to make those decisions. And that's what we're trying to seed in some states, mirroring sort of the Gallup with hard data like return on investment, with other measures, and then putting it in a format that help people make good decisions. There are, there's more information in this country about which cell phone to buy than which college to pursue. I mean, we need to change that. And that's one of the things that we, we have to do, help people make rational decisions for themselves. And now, the video, Pat. <laughs> Yeah, the Talent Pipeline Management Initiative provides a framework for employers to uh, very actively develop a pipeline of talent working in partnership with education and workforce providers. This is a real departure from what we've seen historically where employers tend to have a fairly limited role and then the education and training providers are sort of left to try to figure out what the employers want. Business owners are not engaged enough with the source of where we can find our talent. If you ask most business owners, they're going to say they find their talent by advertising the job on Craigslist or putting it on a job board. Instead of going to the schools that are actually teaching what we need. To, to address some of the challenges, the first thing we're doing is focusing on what we can own and, and correct internally. So one of the things we, we are absolutely committed to doing is thinking uh, about talent in more of a pipeline format. The biggest challenge is actually shifting the mindset to a longer term view of talent and thinking about how do I build a broader supply or pipeline of talent so it's ready when I need it and, and where I need it. So that mindset shift is a, is a big, big piece that, that I think is a challenge in industry. As you look at Alcoa, the complexity of the talent needs actually reflect the complexity of the business. Well, employers and educators really need a new kind of partnership. Historically, they have, they have not worked very effectively together. The places that are really excelling and taking this to a whole new level are working hand in hand with employers on a continual basis to understand how competencies in, in, in the workplace and education can be sort of brought together and, um, and continually improve to keep pace with changing um, job requirements um, and, and to ensure that the academics standing is also there. The Chamber Initiative for the Talent Pipeline is a new concept, but it's a simple concept to employers like myself. Even small employers have been so engaged in supply chain management for years. For me, it's been a good collaboration. It's been a partnership of our other companies, whether they're in the state or nationally, to really do something about this. So when, when I think about the skill, skills gap, I think about a couple things. Um, one of the biggest reasons I think it's pervasive is we aren't beginning with the end in mind. So what I mean by that is, is if jobs are, are the end goal or, or that's the target condition, getting people employed and getting jobs in place, we need to, to focus on the employer first. Well, what we're doing is a partnership. We're not just sort of another education provider on a list. We're um, working with the employers to help them solve very specific challenges related to workforce, be it around talent and leadership development, 
retention, succession planning. I think the, the, the bigger picture on the uh, supply chain is what does it look like from a practical application standpoint? Because right now we have theory, we have you know, thought, we have an outline of a paper, which I think is fabulous, but I think we really need to also show what, what does good look like? What do success stories look like? And demonstrate how people are using the supply chain concepts relative to talent, so we can actually get some people to, to start trying new things and applying the concepts to get the true success stories. Please join me again in thanking our keynote presenter, Carol DeMuzzo. I wanted to just make a, a comment about the alignment between what Carol talked about and some of the work that we're doing at the Commission in three particular areas. One, um, we have several Commission members who are here with us today. Would you raise your hand if you're a current or former member of the Commission? Thank you. We appreciate you being here and the work that you do on a basis and we ask a lot of you I know but one thing you will recall is about a year ago a little over a year ago we approved a resolution to close the achievement gap in Indiana we've talked a lot about the that disparity in those numbers today and the goal that we set was to close the achievement gap by 2025 and to cut it in half by 2018 obviously a very ambitious goal but one that we thought to establish a goal anything less than that would be to send the wrong message so I think a lot that we heard today from both Carol uh, Lieutenant Governor Elsperman, I think, speaks to the importance of doing that. Second, we talked a lot about people who have some college but no degree, and about the 750,000 uh, Hoosiers who have some college and no degree. Please join us in the work that we're trying to do, and we're called Return and Complete, as we partner with our colleges and universities to make it easier, smooth transition, we talked about, Carol, for students to go back and meet um, that complete their degree, something they obviously aspired to do at one point, and we want to make it easier for them to do that. And then third, I'll just close with our commitment to using data in the way that you talked about really driving these policies undergirded by good data and the Commission's continuing commitment to get that right. And we need to really, once again, partner with our colleges and universities. <laughs>